Hey everybody, well, part four time of Rado runs through his ridiculously overstocked game shelf. Alrighty, let's get going. Let's see if we can get through this thing in under an hour. Fingers crossed. Alrighty, starting with some Cosmos games. First one, Star Wars, Angriff der Klonkrieger, or Attack of the Clones, basically the board game version of the second prequel film from designers Inca and Marcus Brand, who did the excellent, 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 excellent Village. Cannot rave enough about Village, and honestly, that is the reason I picked this game up, because they were the designers. Didn't know anything about it. I just know it's a co-op game where players are Jedi trying to work cooperatively to fend off wave after wave after wave of droids and trying to stay alive and beat the timer, effectively. Haven't played it yet, don't know if it's any good, but again, Love the pedigree of the designers, and I, I personally, I don't really have any problem with the prequel movies. I think it's a fine fodder for a board game, so looking forward to trying it sometime. Moving on to Helvetia, and now, this is an interesting one. This is the game that, well, if it wasn't for this game, you probably wouldn't be watching this video right now. It's affected your life, if you can believe it. This is the first game I did a run-through for, almost two years ago now, coming up. Pretty soon, just uh, another month or two, I think. We've been doing this for two years. Uh, and I did this originally. Is it two years or one year? No, it's two years. Yeah, 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 two years. Um, I, I did this originally because there were just some people online bemoaning the fact that there were no videos for it and they weren't sure if they should import it because Cosmos, I don't know why they don't want Americans' money, but they just don't. They just can't be bothered to ever, you know, even though this game is completely language independent, they cannot be bothered to just print English rules. So people want to know more about it and I figured, what the heck, I'll do a video. And it worked out pretty well and now here I am today doing this video for you guys. But anyway, the game itself, enough about history. It's a really, really cool game that is all about building a village in the Swiss Alps. And you can see all these different little tiles that represent different buildings you can add to your village. But, you know, and that's all pretty straightforward. It's a worker placement game where you have your discs and you place them over on these different things to do different actions and whatnot to build and expand and generate goods that you can then sell to the big city to get points and all that. So that's all nice. But what's really cool about this game is, like, you know, this is the, this is the blue player's village. And you can see every one of his houses, he's got a blue worker on it who mans that house and generates the goods. But you'll notice, I mean, this house right here has a single lady who lives in it, as does this one. This house, however, had a blue man who some other player, the red player, decided they were going to marry that man. That's what's really cool about this game. Your workers can marry the workers from other villages. And as soon as you marry your way into somebody else's village, you get access to their resources. And that's really, really awesome. But at the same time, they get access to um, to your oh, what's a nice way to uh, well, basically, um, you know, once you marry into somebody else's village, you're helping them out a lot because then they can have kids, and then that increases their workforce and lets them increase the size of their the size of their village. It's a really, really clever system, quite unlike anything else out there, and it's just really a lot of fun. And amazing that it doesn't get more press. But I'll say, I guess I'm not surprised because, again, Cosmos, just for whatever reason, just doesn't want to do the extra tiny little bit of work. Oh, I don't know. What do I know? I don't know anything about it. Maybe it's a ridiculously huge amount of work, but it's a real shame because this game deserves a much, much bigger audience. But anyway, moving on to Nauticus. Now, I haven't played this yet. And I picked it up at Essen this year. It's another Kramer Kiesling game. All I really know about it is it is about building ships, and you can see those stacks of ships, fronts, and you know bows and afts, and you know uh, midsections, and making taller and taller masts. I assume all to score points. Like here's somebody who's been building, and that just looks fun. Uh, and plus, it looks like it has some kind of rondelle that you know looks like it's got a bunch of tiles, so it's probably in constant motion. It looks really, really cool. And Kramer and Kiesling have been on a tear lately, so I am very cautiously optimistic. Can't wait to try Nauticus. Okay, alrighty. Uh, cave. I have done a run through for this, so you can check that out. And this is a game, another game from Adam Kaluza the designer of K2 over there. And I talked about that last time, how that was from a designer who actually had climbed K2. And I don't know if Adam has done a lot of spelunking, but playing this game really does give a very, very good impression of feeling like you're making the decisions that explorers in a new underground cave system have to deal with. I mean, it is all about, you know, blind tile drawing and expanding this cavern as you explore and score points for basically making underground discoveries. But what's really interesting is you have to focus 
a lot on inventory management because you, everything you've got with you is you're out exploring, you carry on your back and you can't, don't have very much to carry. And you've got to make sure, you have to be very, very careful as you expand that you have enough resources to be able to make it back to base camp. Because if you, ever, if you can't, well, it's not a pleasant sight. It can really slow you down and hamper you. So you have to be really, really careful about inventory management. Very, very neat game. Plays well with newbies. Uh, we've had good success in a lot of different circumstances. Really like the cave. Ah, uh, and then here's another uh, Adam Kalusa. This is, for all intents and purposes, I think the sequel to K2. Uh, instead of being on K2, it's now on Mount Everest. And haven't played it yet, but the board itself looks very, very similar to the K2 board. Everything looks, you know, I, I suspect it'll be very, very similar. The same kind of card driven management as you carefully work your way up the mountain. But I know the big addition to this game, which I'm very excited about, is the fact that you're not alone climbing this mountain. You are actually taking tourists who want to, you know, who have hired you as a guide to get them alive to the top. And the thing is, the richer they are, and therefore the more points you score, the tougher it is to keep them alive because they're not as experienced mountaineers themselves. So it sounds like a really, really cool addition to a game that we already really, really love. Can't wait to try Mount Everest. Okay, here's some fantasy flight goodness. We're starting with Runebound. I've done a run through for this. This used to be our go-to game for board game high adventure as you traveled all over the world of, I forget what it's called, Terranoth, I think. And, you know, fought monsters and completed quests and leveled up and got items and all that stuff. You know, it's actually a pretty straightforward game. You know, it's pretty standard fare. The one thing that makes it really special, and it's the one reason we keep it around, is the way movement works. Because you've got all these different types of terrain that you move over. You know, rivers and roads and mountains and forests and, and you know, open plains. And to find out how far you can move on a given turn, you roll a bunch of special terrain dice. And then that becomes a very simple but very fun and fulfilling little puzzle to decide how how can you use those dice to move as far as, as possible, as cleverly as possible through the environment? It's those dice that keep us coming back and keep us enjoying this game, even though we have moved on to otherwise much, much better, bigger and better um, board game adventure titles, which I'll be talking about very, very shortly. But first, here is The Fury of Dracula. I've done a run-through for this one as well, although I didn't particularly enjoy it. I only did it because of backer requests. But it worked out pretty well. And, you know, this is, an, this is a really, really cool game. We really love it, in theory, quite a bit. One player is Dracula sneaking all over oldie-style Europe, basically trying to set up nefarious plots into play, and moving by playing cards face down, and that becomes a history of where they've done. And meanwhile, the other players are hunters searching all over trying to find him, trying to stumble across his path, and then, you know deduce where it is he's gone so they can corner him and kill him because he's Dracula and he's bad. It's really, really cool. And then, you know, it's fun as heck being Dracula, kind of sneaking between the net that the hunters are trying to cast and all kinds of stuff. But the real problem with it is there are so many cards and so many rules. And as a two-player game, one player has to control four different hunters at once. It's very unwieldy. And in fact, recently I've been thinking about maybe trading it away in all honesty. Um, but still, there's nothing quite like it for, well, actually, no, there is. There's a, a Jack the Ripper game that apparently captures a lot of this, but Jen has no interest in playing Jack the Ripper. So, for now, we hold on to Fury of Dracula. Okay, remember I was saying Runebound's kind of been replaced? It's been by this, Legends of Andor. Now, this is an amazing game. This is our absolute rock-solid favorite adventure, you know, high epic adventure role-playing game. So you can see, it plays out on this big, giant board. I've done a run-through for this one as well. And what's really interesting about it, what separates it from pretty much all the other games of its ilk is this is a Eurogamer's version of an adventure game as opposed to an Ameritrasher's version, which is really what Runebound or Descent or whatever. I mean, because this game, you know, while it does have leveling up and fighting monsters and, and getting loot and all that stuff, this is a puzzle. Because in, whenever you're going on an adventure, these monsters are constantly streaming towards the castle. And if enough of them uh, um, attack the castle, you instantly lose. So you figure, hey, while you're doing all your quests and whatnot, no problem, you'll just fight the monsters and beat them before they hit the castle. But every time you beat a monster, it pushes you forward on this time track. So you have to be very, very careful. You have to basically engage in this monster management because you have to kill enough of them to keep the castle safe, but if you kill too many of them, the story will be over preemptively, and you won't actually get a chance to finish the quest. So it becomes an incredibly complex and interesting and intricate puzzle to solve every time you play. Plus, 
it uh, has a ton of replayability. There's one. It comes with several re pre-written legends stories, five of them, and the middle one, the third one, comes with a huge amount of replayability. This game has as much replayability as a pure co-op as Pandemic does, and it has as much puzzle solving and um, you know tension as Pandemic. I mean, this is Pandemic, you know, it, it, different mechanisms and whatnot, but it really kind of engenders that same feel in a fantasy setting. We absolutely love it, and you know, it is literally it's criminal that Fantasy Flight. The publisher of it has, I mean, there's been tons of really cool stuff, expansions and whatnot that have come out for this in German from the original publisher, but uh, Fantasy Flight just can't be bothered to translate them and put them out in English. And even though it won the Spiel des Jahres, or the Kenner Spiel des Jahres, for best game of the year, I mean, this uh, Fantasy Flight should be bending over backwards trying to support this thing, and yet they don't seem to. It's very, very frustrating. Um, fortunately, some users are actually slowly translating all that stuff, um, you know, on an amateur level, and it's it's going pretty well, but oh, shame on you, Fantasy Flight. Shame on you for not continuing to support the single best game in your entire catalog. Just criminal. Anyway, but still, we absolutely love it. And even if Fantasy Flight never puts anything out, we would still love the game because it's a great uh, cooperative game with tons of replay value. Legend of Andor. Okay, continuing with the um, Fantasy Flight theme. Now, here's a game Fantasy Flight puts out more... Um, oh god, I mean, there, I don't know how many expansions there are for this now. Maybe 20? Probably getting close to that. It's a card game, a cooperative card game, where players, each player gets their own little group of famous Tolkien characters. Um, and, and not so famous ones. And um, you, you uh, race against the clock, as represented by this kind of doom counter thing, to defeat whatever plan Sauron has put into, into play. And there's tons of them. There's been so many expansions for this. It's a nice game. We enjoy it. It's not the greatest game in the world, but you know, someday I really should do a run-through for it, because I think it deserves it. Okay, and then Blue Moon City. Don't know much about this. Pick this up. This has been out of print for a long time, and it's kind of hard to get. I stumbled across it in a board game store store in, in Portugal, I think, while I was on vacation one time. Just walked in and they had a copy for a retail price and I just snagged it on the spot that was still in shrink because uh, who knows when I was going to be able to pick it up again. Don't know much about it. It's clearly a tile land game. I think you're, I think it's that, you know, the city's been destroyed and so that you can see all those gray ones and you have to repair them. Um, and it has something to do with like coordinating or triangulating space. I'm not really quite sure, but it's from Reiner Knizia. Supposedly it's very good. We'll definitely be trying it someday. Yay, 12 minutes to finish the first row. Oh, we are making good time. Not. Okay, on to the second shelf. Chin from Reiner Knizia. This is a series of Pegasus Spiel games I put all next to each other. This is a very, very cool game. Jen and I actually like it quite a bit. I've done a run through for it, and it's a it's a really light, fast playing tile game. I mean, basically, you could, you could consider it Tigris and Euphrates, really, really baby brother. Although it, it, that's not really fair. I mean, it's 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 much much simpler. Like it's it's much closer to Go than it is to Tigris and Euphrates. But really, really clever game about tiling, where all the tiles are two spaces and they come in a whole bunch of different colors. So you have to be really really clever about how you expand and try to claim territory. The board itself has two sides, and in fact, two more boards have been released that I'm looking forward to getting. This is a great game, plays well with anybody, uh, a lot of fun, plays fast, that's Chin. Okay, Milestones have done a run-through for this from uh, designer Stefan Dora, uh, the, guy, the guy who did For Sale, which of course is a really, really a classic, and this is a really nice game. The run-through uh, hopefully shows it off pretty well. But, you know, really one of those should get a lot more attention too, I think. But it's a game about building routes, um, you know, to, to grab resources out on the board. And the interesting thing about the route building is that players are really working in lockstep. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of synergy between players and it really creates a lot of tactical depth on this expansion as you build, because we're building the same road. And we kind of hopscotch and leapfrog over each other to grab stuff. But what's even cooler is this little... Oh, what do you call it? It's effectively a, a programmable rondelle where your your piece is constantly moving around like this, and you could go from this, you can jump further far ahead, but you you can never go back. But the thing is, you're constantly filling this with different workers, and you're constantly losing them because if you have a really good worker, chances are the king is going to take them for himself, and so you're constantly having to readjust your rondelle and get the right workers to produce the right goods at the right time so that you can jump into the lead while building this road. There's, it's a really really clever game. Like it a lot. Milestones. Mutant Meeples. Haven't played this one yet from designer Ted Allspock. We really love his Suburbia. This one came out before. I believe it's something to do with these are a bunch of little superhero Meeples. And they all have different abilities, different ways they could move, and it, they, you know, but they don't belong to anybody. It's basically at the beginning of a round, 
the board is set up, there's a puzzle to solve, and players can basically, I believe, race. And the first one who thinks he can figure out the puzzle goes for it and then proves whether he could figure it out or not and scores points. Don't know much about it, but I like the idea. Loved Suburbia, so can't wait to try Mutant Meeples. Ah, Ito. Have done a run-through for this. Excellent, excellent game. If you're at all familiar with... Brr. Lords of Waterdeep, which I talked about quite a while ago, and I think on the second one, there's Lords of Waterdeep way up there. This is Lords of Waterdeep for gamers. Whereas Lords of Waterdeep is a great gateway worker placement game, this is a gamer's game that you know takes some of the same ideas. There are a bunch of quests, you're placing workers in this city in all kinds of different areas to get the resources you need to complete those quests. But the game is actually much more solidly thematic. I mean, things just are really grounded and make a lot of sense. And there's just a lot of intricacy and depth to this game that makes it a lot of fun. Edo. Also, uh, it comes with event cards that can be either not too terribly nasty or you can put in super nasty ones. A lot of people complain the game's too hard, but I just say, well, don't put in the super nasty ones. The rules even say take them out if you find them too nasty. But anyway, very, very cool game. On to, I just did a run through for Coal Barons here or Glukalf just a month or two ago, I think. This is a, another cool Kramer Kiesling game. Uh, they're really on fire this year. Um, and it's basically about industrial era, you know, the era of industrialization in Germany as you're running coal mines and, you know, slowly building out these mines by getting, you know, in kind of this tile draft, the, the, the right tiles to collect the right type of coal and using action points to move this elevator up and down and, you know, kind of manage your time wisely so you can fulfill contracts as fast as possible. It's a really good, solid, Cube pushing Euro game, and we enjoy it quite a bit. Actually, Jen liked it a lot. I think it's neat, but Jen really loved it. And on the flip side, I think Rococo is awesome, and Jen just thinks it's really, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, opposite. I mean, she loved this, I liked it. I love this, she liked it. Both really great games. Rococo from Matthias Kramer, who I already talked about a bit with Helvetia. This is a game of 17th or maybe it's 18th century French dressmaking for the aristocracy. You are a dressmaker, and you've got to mix the right materials with the the right employees, you have to you know, constantly hire and fire people to make the dresses to score a lot of points because the game takes place in the uh, the days leading up to a big ball that the King Henry or King Ludwig, no, Louis the uh, 15th is throwing. Very, very cool, clever game. Really interesting take on area control in a way that normally we don't like area control, but we really like it in this game. But what's even cooler is the way deck building works. This, is, this has a very fresh take on deck building. If you'd like to know more, you can watch my run through. Okay, Vinos. I've only played this once a couple of years ago, and Jen liked it. It kind of really destroyed my brain. We haven't played it since, but I really need to get to the table again. This is a, a very super duper, really one of the heaviest games we own. Economic simulation of running wine vineyards and trying to make the best wines to win at contests and stuff like that. As you can just see from the board, there is so much going on. So many things to keep track of. So many things to balance. It's a really, really clever, complex game and I really uh, someday actually probably before too long I'm, in, in 2014 I will definitely be doing a run through for it guaranteed let's see oh also by the way these are um, several what's your game this is a really hot up-and-coming publisher in Europe I'm really you know they've quickly catapulted themselves so whenever they put a game out I'm stoked Asgard haven't played yet. Uh, apparently, it's a fairly heavy game that's all about Ragnarok and all that sort of things. We you know the tree Yggdrasil in the center and worker placement using all the Norse mythology characters. Don't know much about it yet. Looking forward to it. I've heard actually maybe that it's not so great with only two, so I'm a bit nervous, but fingers crossed. Okay, Vasco da Gama. Ah, I really need to do a run through for this to uh, because it's an excellent game. Uh, you know, it's it's another one of these age of exploration. You know, as uh, you know, the the European powers are sending ships off to their far east colonies and all that, and you know, bringing back goods and whatnot. And it's a worker placement game, but the twist is there's a huge amount of risk management and risk mitigation with your workers because you place your workers in these um, on these you, you place your workers in such a way that there's a certain order that they will be able to actually activate and so if you want to activate sooner you take a higher number you know if you want to be actually first you know be the first worker as opposed to the 20th worker that gets placed but there's a danger that the sooner you activate that you might actually get screwed um, by a by by random chance by random card draws and not get to do your actions at all so it's really really tense as you just kind of inch your way up towards the top and you really want to it's it's basically actually if you're familiar at all with Kalis 
Um, the concept of how the provost is always has the potential to screw you if you are like working close to the provost. This basically mimics that idea, but it's not under player control. It's um, and you know, it's, honestly, we actually enjoy this a lot more than Kalis, even though it has a lot of the same ideas. Really, really neat game. Need to do a run through for it. Vasco da Gama and Madeira. I just did a run through for this a couple months ago, might a month ago. Awesome game, Pro maybe the heaviest game of the year. Really cool worker placement where you're placing dice with a lot of really neat mechanisms. The, again, the most interesting one being the idea that you can place your workers to you know, get services and goods from these different places, these different characters who you're placing your workers on, and but then you have to pay them, and you have the option to um, not pay, to basically bow out and you know, and accumulate debt, and then get rid of that debt in other ways. And so, if both you and another player have gone to this guy, and then you don't pay your bills, suddenly the other player who went to him has to pay more. Um, very, very cool game. A lot of really neat subtle interaction. Super heavy though. I mean, all of these games are really, really heavy, but that's really what's your game. I mean, they're really pushing themselves as a publisher that puts out really, really top-notch, colorful, high, well-produced, and really meaty, thinky Euro games. Okay. Oh, I bought a little bit of time back. Let's keep going. Let's see. That was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Yeah, I guess this will be an hour or so. Okay. A bunch of little short ones. Uh, let's see. This is... I shouldn't even be showing this to you guys, because there's no way in heck you're ever going to be able to get a copy of it. This is Expedition Sumantra. I believe something like only 200 copies of this, or some really ridiculously small number like that, were ever made. And I've got one of the very, very few in the world, and my understanding is they are never going to reprint this game. Now, actually, they have. They reprinted it um, and rethemed it. Where is it? It's over there. As I talked about in the first run through, Los Incognitos. But this is the original, and if anything, I actually, I have to admit, I really like, it's the same game, but this is a theme of being tourists in, in, um, in Africa, or well, well in, in some Africa-like area, just um, you know, rolling dice to move by boat and by jeep and whatnot to take pictures of animals. And the new one, it's been updated to be all about time-traveling aliens trying to capture other time-traveling aliens or something like that. I really like the original theme, love this wooden box it comes in, love how tiny it is. Is. Everything about this game is fantastic, except for the fact that it's impossible for you to get your hands on. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, pick this up this year. This is a one player runs the dungeon, the other player runs the heroes. Hero versus Guardian, a game dungeon, uh, you know, a game of dungeon craft. Haven't played it yet. Don't really know much about it. Got it on Kickstarter, mostly because I like the art. Um, hoping it's good. We'll find out in due time. Okay. Ooh, I'm gonna get back down again. I'm getting tired. The city. Oh, I waited forever to get this. Forever and ever and ever because this is from Tom Lehman, the designer of Race for the Galaxy. This is a this is actually kind of a Race for the Galaxy light where you're building cities as opposed to building an intergalactic civilization. And if all I mean, honestly, I like the idea of building a city with his systems better. But unfortunately, as you can see, uh, it's not language independent. So some of the cards actually have German on them. And I've waited and waited and waited and waited for an English version of this to come out. And it, it, apparently it's never going to come out. So I eventually broke down. I've got the German copy now. I'm going to have to do some paste up for these cards that have Deutsche on them. And we'll hopefully be playing it soon. But really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, because sometimes it's, it's nice to play a light version of Race for the Galaxy. And yes, I know San Juan provides that. But looking forward to seeing what the city provides. All right. Smart City, or I'm sorry, not Smart City, that's going to be the next one. This is Card City, which is a sequel to Town Center, which I'll be talking about in a center. Uh, and I, I haven't played this. I played the prequel, Town Center, really liked it. Have actually done several runs for that, and basically got this because this is an evolution of the ideas in Town Center brought to card form. You know, this is a cube stacking game, and this turns them into cards, and I think changes the rules in some ways. Love the ideas here, can't wait to try them here, but I'll talk about that one in a second. Slavinka. Apparently this is actually a really good game. I really need to get to play. I mean, actually there's quite a few of these games I haven't played. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, actually, I'm sorry. I can't really say much about it. But looking forward to trying it. And then Vampire Empire. This is apparently a very, very good game as well. Um, I know Joel Eddy raved about it. And I haven't played it yet. I really, really should. I've had this game for over a year. I'm so sorry, White Goblin Games and uh, Philippe Milinski. I'm sure it's great. I've heard nothing but really, really good things. Just haven't gotten around to getting it. Too many games. 
Yeah, I know, first world problems, right? Okay, Sneaks and Stitches. Got this because it's from Vlashavadal and I'm on a mission to play every one of his games if possible. This is a really, really light card game from him. And once again, haven't gotten to play it yet. Don't really know if it's, it's it, from reading it, you know, it's all about, you know, getting your right team of heister guys and, and, and you know, pull off jewel heists at all these different locations and play your cards in secret and bluff your opponents and whatnot. Haven't played it yet. I hope it'll work well with two, but we'll see. Ah, Scripps and Scribes. Again, soon I will stop saying haven't played it yet. This is a dice version of Biblios. And Biblios, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, it's way up there. Biblios is by far, well actually I'm not even going to say one of them. It is our favorite filler game. Biblios is an awesome, 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 fast playing auction game with cards. And now this takes a lot of the same ideas and replaces them with dice. Can't wait to try it. Haven't tried it yet though. Quarantine. Okay, uh, this is this is, for all intents and purposes, the closest thing we've had so far to Sim Hospital, the board game. Because this, in this game, it is a tile laying game, you know, similar to Carcassonne, where you are designing, doing the layout, and building a hospital as you play. And while you're doing that, a line of people, represented by these cubes who have different maladies, are lining up outside trying to get into all these matching color rooms that you're building. It's a really, really cool idea. Love the idea of this so much. Love the special powers of the rooms. Love the random setup. There's a lot to love here, but the thing we don't love is it really feels like it's not that good with two. It really feels like it needs to have more players. But then once you have more players, this becomes a very mean attacking game as well. A really a real smack your opponents around and you know um, and stab them in the back kind of game, and uh, so uh, I have real mixed feelings about it. I like the ideas a lot, but it's just not the kind of game Jen and I would normally enjoy. But oh, we love the idea of it so much. Why must it be so backstabby? Why? Uh, oh well. Anyway, I need to play it a few more times before I decide if we're going to keep it or not. Probably should do a run through for it. But anyway, that's quarantine. Uh, but again, if you if you're looking for a Sims Hospital, you don't mind backstabbing, you have more than two players to play, I think I would pretty much highly recommend this game because I think it's very clever. Jungle Ascent. I got this one, I have to admit, on a whim ugh, off of Kickstarter last year. Haven't played it yet. And actually, I think I probably shouldn't have quite gotten it on them. Mostly got it because I love the theme. You know, Jen and I, we're old 8-bit era video game junkies. We, you know, played the heck out of Bubble Bobble together and, um, you know, Ice Climbers and all that. And this seems like a video game version of those games where you're basically at the bottom trying to climb up to the top and building the landscape that lets you do it, but also dropping off enemies along the way. Now, I was never really too excited about this as a competitive game, but supposedly there are co-op rules. Looking forward to trying those because, again, I mean, I really really remember very fondly Bubble Bobble and Ice Climber. I hope this we have as much fun playing this cooperatively as we did back in those old 8-bit NES days. Okay, Targi. This game is awesome. Boy, talk about a game that has not gotten as much attention as it should. This game is absolutely amazing. It's a two-player only game. You can see this is a grid representing a desert with a whole bunch of nomadic traders and whatnot uh, moving around. And, and you have your own tribe of, of desert traders. And it's a really, I, I can't, I should really do a run through for this. I can't really get into the mechanics right now. But Jen and I, we were blown away by just how good this game was the first time we played it. It really surprised us. Excellent game. Targi. Ah, Castles. I think this has been out of print for a long time. Might be getting kind of hard to get. But it's a... F oh, man, there's no art. Great. Well, it's a very, very fun, silly card game where um, you have a... I forget what it is. A 5x5 five five or maybe a 6x6 six six grid that represents the courtyard of a castle. And you're playing all these square cards into all the different, into all the different spaces of this grid. And you're trying to get rid of all the cards in your hand. The first player to do that wins. And you're constantly playing cards that will force other players to take cards off the castle and put them back in their hands. It's a really fun mind game, um, you know, as, 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 and we just really enjoy it a lot. Very, very cute, very funny, really, really sprightly, plays quick. It's a shame it's not more readily available because it's a neat game. Ah, this is easily one of the best games of 2013. I believe, at, as of right now, this is our second best game, uh, right after Nations, which is the best game of 2013. And uh, bear in mind, that might change. There's still a lot of 2013 games I have to play, but Forbidden Desert is the best of the best. From Matt Leacock, the designer of Pandemic, one of our favorite games of all time. Uh, this is players are working cooperatively to try to stay alive in a desert. And th this um, actually shows just... Um uh, a three by three, but the desert itself is five by five. And the interesting thing about it is, 
if the sands of this desert are constantly shifting, that central space there, you're constantly moving it around based on card draws and constantly filling up the desert with more and more sand that has to be cleared out because you're digging like crazy to find this underground city that's been lost in the desert, which is the key to your survival. Amazing game, incredible tension, a lot to think about, um, but you could still play this with anybody. It's a really great gateway game, but it's, uh, it's just, I, I cannot rave enough. I've done a run through for it. I'll stop right there. It's an incredible game, Forbidden Desert. Okay, back into the realm of Nine Flight. Now actually, I have played Tashket once. Or actually, Jen and I, we played most of the way through, and I really need to play it again, because I, I don't remember what it was, but I remember we liked the idea of this quite a bit. It's another one of these, you know, um, nomadic traders in the desert kind of games. But oh, I'm trying to remember, I'm, uh, but I can't really remember much about it. I need to play it again. It's been so long. And th I got this at the same time as this. These are both from the same publisher, uh, Dashur which I really don't know anything about it. Just need to get played. So many games. Again, very, very sorry. Need to get these, but there's so many games. All right, now, Town Center. This is interesting. This is the only game that I have actually done two, I think maybe even three. I've either done two or three separate run-throughs for this at one point or another, because this is actually the third printing of this game. And, um, right, no, yeah, so I've done two. I did an original printing for when I got it, when it was just like a really small print run. The guy hand-boxed um, them himself. And then when he did a second print run, I did another run through showing how he had upgraded the pieces. And now he's got a much more proper professional one. I'll actually be doing a run through for this pretty soon because this game is about to go on Kickstarter. And I love the game so much, I told him, yeah, I'd be more than happy to help out and, sh and you know, in conjunction with the run throughs I've done previously, show the new version. But it basically, at its heart, this is an abstract city building game where you're stacking cubes on top of each other. So you're really building the city in 3D. And the 3D matters a lot. And you can see two players in this case are both playing. There's a card draft where you're trying to get the right cubes. The cubes have different powers. There are office buildings and power plants and, and um, apartment complexes and all kinds of stuff. Awesome, awesome game. Check out my run-throughs for it. Either one. Actually, the second run-through I did is much better than the first one. But anyway, that's Town Center. Ah, Pasha. From um, Stefan Dora, right? Is that right? I think so. Yeah, Stefan Dora, who also did our very beloved Milestones. And really, it's because we loved Milestones so much that I picked this up at Essen this year, knowing nothing about the game other than it was from Stefan Dora, and it's some kind of dice rolling Yahtzee variant thing. That's all I know. Looking forward to trying it. Stefan Dora is awesome, though. This is a neat game. This is a lot of fun. This was self-published on Kickstarter last year. Really, really glad we picked it up. Like it a lot. This is a game where players have a shared plot, one of these kind of communal plots, where we're both trying to plant our own, you know, vegetable, our own seeds to grow different things. But the the Synergy comes from the fact that when one player waters uh, a plant to make it grow, all you know the water, as you can see, it streams in different directions as well. So if you're really smart about where you lay your stuff in relation to other player stuff, you can get your stuff watered for free. Very, very cool. And the whole thing is driven by dice rolling. Tons and tons of dice rolling. Awesome game. Another uh, wonderful little gem, garden dice. Okay, Rattus Cardus. Actually, have I talked about Rattus yet? Where is it? Oh, anyway, um, this is the card version of Rattus, which is actually a very, very cool area control game. Um, really, this doesn't have much in common with the original game other than the theme, but we actually liked it quite a bit in that you're basically going from town to town and there's kind of... Oh, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's a fun, light, quick playing card game that we thought worked pretty well. Maybe someday I'll do a run through for it if you folks want to see it. Ah, this is all of Dominion except for... What was the most, Guilds was the final expansion, the one before Dark Ages. I have not picked up Dark Ages yet, but otherwise, in these two boxes, this is the entirety of Dominion. Um, you know, every expansion, every promo, etc. in these two incredibly heavy boxes. All interestingly, these are Thunderstone boxes with the Dominion covers on them because the Thunderstone boxes came where you could actually keep all your cards, you know, lined up nice and pretty in a row. So I don't know why, Oh, Rio Grande never did that, but fortunately I had some Thunderstone boxes that I could repurpose to keep my Dominion in two nice and easy stored boxes where everything's all labeled up nice and pretty. Lovely! And then, I'll see, here is the rest of our Thunderstone cards. Between this and wherever the rest of the Thunderstone was down there, uh, it's the entirety of the Thunderstone run. 
I'm going to show you, I haven't done run through either of these, but everybody knows what Dominion is, and Thunderstone is a fantasy version kind of of Dominion with some interesting stuff. We like them both. Dominion, still, to this day, by far the best deck builder there is. Um, disagree? Well, you're wrong. Well, actually, there is no right or wrong. Obviously, it's all subjective opinion, but for our money, Dominion is still the cream of the crop. Nobody's bested it yet, anyway. This is, as far as we're concerned, by far the best Carcassonne. And maybe that's because it is for two players. It is only for two players. It was designed with two players. Reiner Canizia took the basic idea of Carcassonne, and what he added was this castle wall that you have to constrain you. You have to build within the castle and creates a lot more interesting tension as you try to fill up the space, and, you're, and there's just not that much to fill up. And then as well, and this is a brilliant thing. You're not very many games have done it. Uh, you know, as you score, you move your little marker around you know, the score track track that you know runs all around the castle walls but while you're scoring like this little white guy here um, this player if he can what he wants to do is score either two or three points because that means he would land on this space and get that C tile which will give him some special ability so he might be in a situation where he could score like 10 points which would be awesome but that means he'd miss the tile so it creates so much interesting tension as you're not just trying to score the most points but you're trying to score the right amount of points absolutely brilliant Carcassonne itself is a wonderful idea but this is Carcassonne perfection nothing else touches it Carcassonne the city Carcassonne Carcassonne, um, none of them are as good as Carcassonne Castle. The only downside for some people is you, it only plays two players. But hey, that makes it perfect for us. Alrighty, Kalis Magna Carta. I just mentioned Kalis a little bit ago about how we um, we didn't really like Kalis because it was just way too mean. The Provost and all that stuff. Just I mean, we loved the idea, the worker placement. You know, it's kind of like uh, the premier worker placement game. It wasn't the first one, but it was the one that really popularized the idea. And this basically takes Kalis and turns it into a card game where all the worker, you know, that winding road of Kalis becomes a winding road of cards. Every one of these cards is a card that somebody has played and, you know, creates more spots that both players can use for worker placement to get more good so they can play more cards. It's an awesome game. We've often taken it on trips. We think it's a great, great because you get rid of the box and it's just, it's basically it's a handful of cards and some pieces. But it's, this is a, a you know, it's not the, the heaviest game in the world, but this is maybe the best size to weight ratio we have of any game, which is why we really enjoy taking it, because it gives you a lot to think about in the tiniest of tiny packages. Okay, this Magna Carta. Okay, almost, wow, making good time now. Alrighty, let's see. New Haven, right here. Haven't played yet. This is another one I picked up at Essen. I will be doing a run through for this, hopefully this January. Really excited about it. Don't know much about it other than it is another, we have a shared area where we are building a new world colony kind of thing. But that's all I know. Looking forward to trying it. Let's see. Carnag. This is actually a pretty cool game. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of a reverse tower defense because the, the, the tower isn't in the tower in the middle is not what you're trying to defend from all the bad guys coming from the outside. The tower in the middle is where all the bad guys come from and they're streaming all throughout the land trying to escape from this pit in the hole. And meanwhile, we players are on the outskirts of this pit moving around trying to cast spells to put up blockers and zap the monsters. And so, you know, I love the idea of this game. And when I first got it, I thought it was going to be really, really cool because it was going to be this really high pressure, high paced reverse tower defense game. But it turns out it's actually a really slow paced game. And it's much more puzzly than we'd originally thought. Really, really neat idea. A lot of really cool stuff in this game that very few people know about. I really should do a, play, a run through for it too. That's Karnak. <clears throat> Yunnan. Don't know much about it. Picked it up at Essen. And you know what? I might, with the benefit of hindsight, I might not have. Because at the time I just looked at that and said, wow. That looks like there's a lot of really cool um, cube pushing in this game. Can't wait to try it. Looks like some really good meaty Euro-y goodness. But then we found out as a two player, um, one player has to control both the blue and the red. And the other player has to control both the yellow and the, I don't know, whatever the other color is, green. So you have to take on the role of two characters. So I'm really nervous about that. Jen and I almost never like that. Hopefully, Yunnan will overcome that handicap for us. But let's talk about something we do like. Coney Island. And I've done a run through for this. You can check out that video. This is an awesome game. This might be, as far as I'm concerned, Michael Schacht's best game. It is a game where players are, again, it's another one of these things, love these ideas, where you're actually trying to build something you know, on, a, on a grid where players share the space and so you have to you know, kind of stretch out. You know, That's obviously true for uh, Carcassonne, that's true for uh, Garden Dice, that's true. And here we're trying to build an amusement park, a Coney Island type amusement park. Um, and competing to score the most points as we, because it's kind of a 
oh, a Barnum and Bailey type situation where the Barnums and the Baileys, they have to work together to build this thing, but there's a little bit of healthy rivalry as we try to score the most points. But what's really brilliant about this game is everybody's player board. This takes the idea that was, I believe, first introduced in through the ages and then really popularized by Eclipse and, um, oh, I can't think of the other game. Oh, I can't think of it now. I'll put a note up on the screen right there. Can't think of it. Um, but where you have this board and you have all these pieces and when you move these pieces around, they reveal new functions. So um, it's, it's this really brilliant system that allows for a fairly complex you know, cause and event chain with a really simple, um, easy to manage, component system. Absolutely love it. Wonderful game. Really, really clever. This is another one that should get a lot more attention than it does. Coney Island. Okay, Mondo. Ah, this is a real-time tile land game where players are grabbing tiles from this central pile as fast as they can, trying to build their own perfect island and the best way they can to mix and match colors to score a lot of points, while trying to avoid picking up those volcanoes, because the volcanoes lose you points once you're, once you're done and the island is scored. But generally speaking, the volcano tiles are usually the most useful tiles. They give you a lot more flexibility if you do use them. So there's a lot of interesting tension, and the thing actually comes with this big round globe timer that um, you, you set, you get variable lengths of time. And so if you want a nice laid back thing, you can give yourself a lot of time or you can give yourself just a little bit of time. But it's a really nice timer and it's a really fun, solid, light game. It's basically, for those who know it, it's a really light version of Galaxy Trucker, which we talked about. This is kind of, this is heavy me. There's a lot of stuff to bear in mind, a lot of things you really have to pay attention to with transferring power and all that. This is just like a really light, gateway friendly version of Galaxy Trucker without the long, drawn out scoring second half. Uh, Forenza have done a run through for this not too long ago. Excellent tower building game where um, the tension comes because once you start building one of these towers out of these blocks, you can't stop. Um, you, uh, because if, if you do, um, you, you suffer very, very big penalties. So you really don't want to start building them until you know you've got a, a nice pool of excess pieces. But to get those pieces, you have to play really smart trying to grab them off of this row of cards. And this row of cards works like Small World, where the longer a card is ignored, if you don't take a card, the more of these blocks build up on it, so it becomes more and more attractive. Active. But some of the cards actually hurt you. So those generally tend to build up quite a few things before you take them. But then when you do, it can really help you build towers. And then plus you're in a race to build um, certain colors of towers at certain heights. Really, really rock solid, excellent, excellent game. Check out the run through. That's Forenza. And Elvecchio, um, let's see, oh, by the way, these are all some more Pegasus Spiels. Ha this is another one just picked up this year. Haven't played it yet. Don't really know anything about it, hardly at all. Um, it's Florence, around 1430. The Medici family gains dominance over the city through blah, 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 blah. blah. All right, so it, it's, it's a Euro. And um, from Dorn, oh, from Rudiger Dorn. That's why I got it, because he of Goa fame. So, uh, supposedly it's very good. Uh, actually, uh, some people rate it very, very highly. Haven't tried it yet, looking forward to it. Elvecchio, or Elvecchio, probably Elvecchio. Ah, Tanner's Trail from Martin Wallace. Now, the only reason I have that is this was a gift, because this is a three to four player game. But the person giving it to a gift said, well, there's a very good variant. So people say it does play very, very well two player with the variant. And we did find that to be true with Brass, so we're hoping that's true with this, with Tanner's Trail. In fact, actually, this should go with my other Martin Wallace games. This is actually mislabeled, but I'll leave it here for now. But that's all I can say, because we haven't played it yet. Alrighty. Well, I will say thank you again, Demetrius, for the kind, kind gift. Sorry we haven't played it yet. Looking forward to it, though. Tanner's Trail. I've done a run through for Through the Ages, and um, wow, this is the big, this is the, the, this is the big kahuna of civilization building games, although it's unfortunately presented as kind of a dry spreadsheet. It looks like, you know, spreadsheet the board game. But um, watch my run through. It's actually a very tense, very engaging, very satisfying game that lets you basically tell the whole of human history. You know, from our early days as, um, you know, I'm practically one step away from cavemen, right up to the modern era. It's huge, it's epic in its scope, it's really deep, it's really fun. Our only, the only downside is it's also ridiculously long. It's just way too long for us, so we don't play it hardly at all. But it is still amazing, one of the highest rated games on Board Game Geek. One of the best games in the world, arguably. And I've done a run-through if you want to learn more about Through the Ages. Urban Sprawl, have not done a run-through for this. And actually, I have to admit, 
Um, after our first play of this, I was almost ready to, tr to trade it and never look, think of it again. Because our, our first playthrough of it, we it left us a really bad taste in our mouth. But so many people insisted, no, play more, play more. And it turns out, well, basically, it's a city building game where, wow, what a boring presentation. Um, it's, it's got fairly nice components. When you actually set it out in front of you, it looks really nice, although this box isn't doing a very good job of selling it. But it is a competitive city building game where we're building a city. It's, it's, it's a very heavy game. And the reason we didn't like it is because the cards that are coming up all the time are incredibly swingy, incredibly powerful. But if you don't know the game, they are huge random. They, they create these huge random swings of luck in a game that's very heavy and takes a long time to finish. But what everybody argued is, no, 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 you have to play this game enough to where you, you can anticipate what cards are coming and you can plan for them and you prepare for them. And on subsequent plays, we did find that that to be the truth, and so we have kept it, although we're far from experts at it. But anyway, that's Urban Sprawl. Someday, I'm sure I'll do a run through for it. Ah, the Doze Ship. This is a very pretty game. I, I, God, I wouldn't be surprised if very few people have heard of it. It came out at last year's S, and Jen and I like it quite a bit. Uh, again, it's another one of these things where players are... You know, it's a competitive game, but we are building communally. In this one, we are building the Doge's ship, a big, beautiful ship for the Doge, which is kind of like the mayor of Venice. And you can see there's like all these top row pieces and these bottom row pieces and the fore and the aft. But the thing is, you can't build the tops until you build the bottoms. And so you're building left to right on the bottom and then also on the top at the same time, constantly trying to one up, you know, and, and um, you know, and outmaneuver um, your opponent to get your pieces into the right place so you can score the most points. And uh, every round, you roll dice, you can see these dice here, that mix up the worker placement. And you'll completely, because of the way the, the dice come out, radically change the worker placement portion of the game that you use to get the resources you need to build the ship. It's a really clever, really solid game. Another one that deserves more attention, I think. Doge. Oh my gosh, we're almost done. Alrighty, here we go. <clears throat> this won't take long, because I, I have yet to play Tahiti. Got this in a math trade. Actually signed from the designer. Really looking forward to it. Like the idea of it. Uh, randomly generated, you know, Polynesian islands. We ride around on little canoes. It's a pick up and deliver game. Jen and I usually don't like pick up and deliver at all, but I figured I'd take a chance with this one because it seemed like it had a lot of really interesting stuff with the way the map um, develops. Do you try to go through those reefs and lose some of the stuff you're picking up and delivering? Um, and you'll also like the notion that it's kind of a game in two halves. The first half is kind of expanding and building the map, and then the second half is exploiting the map you've built cooperatively or semi-cooperatively. And so it could be cool. Looking forward to it. That's Tahiti. Ah, Heartland. This is awesome. This is maybe one of the best games we've gotten off of Kickstarter, or we're the most happy with. Great, great game. Have played this with a bunch of people, uh, with, with the in-laws. Absolutely loved it. This is... This is really what Ticket to Ride the card game should have been. Although it's not with trains, it's with, um, you know, big rig trucks. But you have this random grid of, you know, Anywheresville, you know, Midwest locations of the U.S., and you are driving trucks around, picking stuff and delivering, picking up stuff and delivering it. But it's all driven by the same card system you get um, in Ticket to Ride, where you draw cards, you try to, you know, get matching sets and then play them to move around. Lots of really cool, clever stuff. Love the little truck meeples. Great, great game. Absolutely fantastic. This one I really should do a run through for. I'm a broken record. I know. Siberia the card game. Have not played this yet. Don't know anything about it other than it is the card sequel to the board game that I haven't played. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Chak. This is actually, or Chishak, I guess, or just Chak. The sound it makes when a sword hits something. Chak is apparently what this is named after. This is a really, really neat kind of bluffing game where you have a handful of cards that represent a party of adventurers, and they're really simple. They just have like ones and twos and fours on them, so they're different values. And you place them face down because each of us are, oops, sorry, that's upside down, trying to adventure up through all the different floors of this castle to c collect treasure. But we don't know ahead of time whether there's gonna be treasure or monsters, and we don't know when we play our adventurers on our side of the, uh, tower what our opponent is going to play and then we reveal at the same time and we see who gets what. I suspect this game is actually a lot better with more players but we still found it to be a fun, quick, you know, very light, engaging filler with two. That's Chak to Chak. Chak! I should stop saying that now. This game is surprisingly in my top 10 best games of all time. And it really, I wouldn't expect it to to. And it's also even more surprising because I've almost never played this anything other than solo. Whenever I play this, it's pretty much I have to play it by myself because this is basically James Cameron's Aliens, 
the board game, although it is in card form. But the cards are laid out to create basically a board that you play on as you play space marines that are constantly under assault from what might as well be Geiger-esque aliens. And you know, it's, it's actually very meaty. There's a lot to think about. Uh, it's very atmospheric. It's very story-driven. I mean, this is the game. I, I, I don't think there's a, a I, I think without exception, every time I've played this game, and this is by myself, at some point, the stakes are so high and it's so tense and you know, everything is riding on, you know, my, my perfect plan will all come off if I can just roll a six and you roll and every time I've ever played, at some point or other, I literally fist pump the air or you know, jump and shout because I get so wrapped up and so excited in the dramatic narrative of this game. Now I've done a run through for this and hopefully it does a good job of showing just how exciting and action packed this game is. Love it, love it, love it. I wish, wish, wish this was done with a fantasy set setting so my wife would play it with me. I have played it with other people and I found that it does play great. It plays great with solo or with more players as a co-op game. But I rarely get a chance to play with anybody else. If only it were a fantasy game. Corey Konetska, why? Why Warhammer 40k as opposed to just Warhammer? Ah, well, whatever. What can you do? Uh, Sobek. This is a very neat little... Um, it's just a neat little card game. I don't really need to go into it too, too much. Um, it's, it's about collecting resources. There's a whole bunch of resources out, and um, you, you try to grab them. It's one of those things where, you know, once you've gone out so, so far to the right, you can't go back to the left. You can't get anything that's behind you, and you're trying to get the right resources in the right match, but you never really know exactly what everybody else has. Neat, fun little game. Me enjoy it, Sobek. And Jiper, oh God, I could almost say the exact same thing. This is another fun little, and this one is a two-player only game, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. A two-player only game that is all about co um, co collecting sets of cards from, you know, a, a uh, marketplace in Marrakesh, or no, in Jaipur, and just a fun, solid game. Jen and I really, really enjoy both of these games. Both excellent gateway card games you could play with anybody. Fun, sweet, innocent, good times. I mentioned this earlier, this is Biblios. This is by far, in spite of how much we enjoy Jaipur and Sobek, this is by far the best filler game we own. You get this game done in under 20 minutes. It's a very exciting, very tense auction every time you play. And I played this with quite a few people. Introduced it to quite a few people. Everybody comes away loving it. Everybody comes away wanting to play again. Absolutely fantastic. Definitely go to Steve Finn's website, Dr. Finn, and um, you know, check out, see if you can get a copy. I think, I think you can order directly from them. I yellow publishes it. Great, great game. And I've done a run through for it, by the way, I should mention. Uh, oh, poor Island of Dr. Necro. This is a co-op game that is really, it's a cool, fun, exciting, pulp noir, high adventure co-op game, no picture, unfortunately, no art, where basically you are working cooperatively. And the cool thing about this game is there's a bunch of cards that are basically adjectives describing an adventurer. And every time you play, you get a couple of random cards. I think there's rules to actually build your own, but we always just like getting random ones. And so you get this randomly generated adventure with all kinds of attributes, like you know whether they're heroic or leaders or robots or you know high flyers or whatever. And they give you a bunch of unique special abilities. So every time you go, um, in your adventure to the Isle of Dr. Necro to save the kidnapped scientists and stop the doom machine from destroying the world, you go in with a different set of adventurers. And then basically, it's... Heck, actually, come to think of it, it kind of reminds me of Ad uh, Pathfinder, the adventure card game. Because basically, you just... You're exploring the island by just drawing a card from a deck and then dealing with whatever the card reveals, and then draw the next card and, and reveal the card what reveal whatever the card was. But unlike Pathfinder, which remember I might have talked about, is um, a really simple, super easy game. This game is very tough. You have to make some really tough choices to win, but it's so satisfying when you do. We actually really enjoy it a lot. I probably should do a run through for it also. Broken record, I know. Paradise Fallen. I just got this not too long ago from Crash Games. And, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, the theme of this is not quite post-apocalypse, but after kind of a down... I don't, I don't even know if it's explained what it is. You know, maybe all the power's gone out or something. But mankind's modern society has had to revert to very primitive state very quick. And so we find ourselves in that situation on the Hawaiian islands, you know, um, with very limited resources, paddling around from island to island trying to get stuff and survive in a very... Savage, savage new world. Really like the idea of the theme. I know Jen might like it too because she really likes those kind of 
um, you know, peak oil thriller type thing. So can't wait to give Paradise Fallen a try. Uh, uh, Zeus him, and this actually, it's not what it's originally name is. I don't remember what it's originally called. Um, oh, I can't think of the name of it at all. But it is a tile land game. Haven't played it yet. Got it um, in a uh, in a mass trade. Might be cool. Haven't tried yet. Can't really say anything about Zeus M. Last three. Okay, it happens. This is from Stefan Feld. This is a Stefan Feld game made for kids, basically. Although you can enjoy it as an adult, it's not bad. It's a dice rolling game where uh, you know the ant eater is trying to get all the ants out of all these different stacks, and you know it's ra you randomly place the different stacks together off of these cards, and you roll dice, which represents you sticking your ant eater tongue down in to get all the ants. It's actually a really cool, clever system. Very simple. Simple enough that you could play it with young children, but still actually gives you a little bit to think about as adults too. If I had kids, they, you know, I'd, I'd be training to be Euro fans early by uh, playing this with them quite a bit. Okay, then we've got <clears throat> Thebes, the, I think this is the Grave Robber, the Grab Robber? Uh, yeah, I think this is, uh, or the Tomb Raiders, Thebes, the Tomb Raiders. This is the card game version of the board game Thebes. And um, it's an excellent, excellent game. I've done a run through for this. I was just checking that out. But basically, it's a race to collect enough archaeological evidence or you know, research that's represented by all these books. You want to get like hands full of research, like, let's see, does it show? It doesn't really show any players hands full of research that you can use then to go digging in four locations in Egypt and Mesopotamia and whatnot to find artifacts that you then put on display at museums to score points. Really good, fun, fast, tense game. Takes everything that was good about Thebes, the original board game, and compresses it down into a game that takes half the time to play and is a very, very cool game. Oh, by the way, I should say, there's an unfortunate, very, very bad typo. Um, the Grave Robber card itself, which is the name, um, it says, it, the, the price of it is wrong. If you ever get this game, when you see the Grave Robber, I think it says it takes three time to get, it only takes one. You can see the threads on Board Game Geek about it. But anyway, bear that in mind. Unfortunate typo on the card. And last but not least, another Steppenfeld game from Queen. Um, this is actually Arena and uh, arena to Roma, both of them in the in the Arena Roma box. They, it's a it's a really cool card game. I've done a run through for it because I've done a run through for pretty much every Stefan Veld game. Although I haven't done one for It's Happens. Oh, I got to do one for that now to be complete. Um, but as you can see, it's got this. It's a, it's one of the games kind of like um, you know uh, Caesar and Cleopatra or. Uh, lost Cities, where either play, both players are, are standing on the opposite side of a line and playing their own cards to their side of the line that can affect, you know, they can score them points and also affect the cards on the opposite side. But the interesting thing is, it also throws in this element of dice. That when you roll the dice every turn, where you, you get to place the dice on different areas, and that's how you choose what to... So you may have played this, you know, this line of cards. It gives you all kinds of powers. But then, will you roll the two that you desperately need to activate that card to take out the enemy's card? Very cool, very clever, incredibly fast-playing game. One of the very few games that is a, an aggressive attacking game that Jen and I enjoy. And there we go. Arena, Roma 2. Okay, folks, that's it. Hope that was entertaining, uh, or eludicating, or educational, or whatever it might be, and come back soon, and I will finish part five, all the games along the top. Be waiting for that. Hopefully, I'll be getting that done within the next week or so, but otherwise, I am going to bid you adieu. Uh, so long, farewell, I've beat Zane. Good night. Oh, um, et cetera, et cetera. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.